Welcome to episode 55 of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Hello everybody. Um, now I'm seeing some concern, some consternation in the comments um, about time. Um, I don't think you should worry about about that, honestly. Irregularities, desynchronicities, I mean it's all it's all ultimately made up isn't it? Right? I mean, time, it's arbitrary. I mean, there are all these different calendars, different yardsticks, different measuring systems, right? Like the Mayans, the Mayans had that really big old calendar, right? Like a 10,000 year calendar or something. And everyone got all upset because they were like, the calendar's gonna end. And some people put two and two together and decided that the world was gonna end. But it didn't. And the moral of that story is that, you know, time can't hurt you. Time can't, can't get us. You know, time, time's just a ghost. Time's incorporeal. Time can't grab us and beat us around the head. So you shouldn't let it rule your life, man. Use, time, time is a tool to be used for your ends, for your purposes. Time's not the tyrant who should tell you what to do. Put time in its place, you know? That's all I'm trying to say. Don't let time tell you what to do. If you feel like getting all a bit swifty or whatever, if you want to take a nap, take a nap. And don't let the clock tell you otherwise. With its big imperious round face. Don't listen to anyone with an imperious round face. Um... But we are going to read a chapter of Game of Thrones, but before we do, uh, we're going to do some brief housekeeping. Some people have been suggesting um, all manner of different different, different little places on the internet uh, where some kind of little, little swifty uh, place community can exist online. So there's been like a Facebook group and there's been talk of Discord. Um, my vote... For what it's worth, I'm assuming I get a vote. I would hope so. I would get at least one vote. Discord sounds good, I think. Um, Discord, I think, makes sense. Facebook is kind of gross for, for a whole bunch of reasons. Reddit is a bit sort of impersonal. I think Discord is a good compromise, and it's also flexible in a bunch of ways. And Discord can do, you know, voice chat stuff, which I think could be uh, incorporated into this show in certain ways. Some of you have noticed upgrades that we've been making, right? We got this shiny fancy new thing on the stream, which means uh, you can see the chat, you can see the chat on the window in the stream. It just started working, I think. So um, now all of your comments, which previously were, were fucking lost to the wind after making them because YouTube doesn't save those live comments, now your comments appear on screen in the chat itself, immortalized to be to be archived into the YouTube channel. Um, so what I'm trying to all I'm trying to say is now that you're on the record, uh, you know, future employers will be able to you know rifle through your your YouTube history on Alt Swift X and you know just sort of assess your employability on the basis of your uh, YouTube live comments. Isn't that great? <laughs> Transparency, the Zucker age, that's what we're living in. Um, here I go killing again, says Martian Assassin. See, now that is gonna, now, now you're gonna be held accountable for all of your wayward assassinations, Martian Assassin. Although, Martian Assassin, are you an assassin who assassinates Martians, or are you a Martian who assassinates a whole bunch of different people? Oh, the Adderall thing. I did see the Adderall thing. Um, I've, 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 I've had someone investigate my drug use. Someone's done a bit of detective work, um, and they've analysed all of, uh, well, not me. This is alt, alt shift X that we're discussing, that, um, that other guy. Um, but some, some individual called, uh, uh, some bloke on Reddit has accused alt shift X of taking, uh, all manner of performance enhancing drugs. Uh, which which almost sort of implies that that alt shift couldn't do it like au natural right which is almost you know under don't don't misunderestimate alt shift x is all I'm trying to say oh Martian assassin has clarified so Martian assassin is a Martian who is an assassin think 
Marvin the Martian turned assassin. Okay, alright, well I'm glad we've cleared that up. So you don't kill Martians then. Um, you only... Um, uh, would you kill a Martian if you were paid to kill a Martian? I mean, uh, assassins don't like choose their targets, right? I would think. Um, oh, we've got a bit of fan theorizing going on. People have pointed out no one's ever seen Alt Shift X and Alt Shift X uh, in the same room. Um, that's true. So maybe they are the same person. Who knows? It's it's a genuine mystery. There are some things I suppose we'll never know, you know? Um, who built the pyramids? Uh, uh, what's at the bottom of the Mariana Trench? Um, uh, what's the moon made of? Um, uh, is, is gravity a myth? Um, we'll never know. We'll never know these things. Some things are unknowable. Um, so I think we just better left, leave those mysteries lie. Um, but yes, anyway, we've got all these exciting technical upgrades. I think it's very exciting. Um, and, and without any further ado, how about we read this fucking, this fucking book, eh? Um, so the chapter is Daenerys 6, A Game of Thrones. Um, and, uh, and it starts with some sex. With George R. R. Martin, it's always sex or food, or violence. Um, he's all, he's all about the old id stuff, right? He's all about those, those, those earthly pleasures. Um, so we start with some sex, uh, and Khal Drogo takes his pleasure from Daenerys, which is a rather, uh, one-sided way of describing sex, I think. Uh, and then we get a, a nice long description of Drogo's naked body, uh, which again feels very much like a food description. We get his bronze skin in the ruddy light and the faint lines of old scars, and his manhood glistening wetly. Uh, no doubt we'll soon... <laughs> and the next line's gonna... And then, and then Daenerys had grease running down her chin. Um is probably going to be the next line. Um, old scars. Did you know they've done studies and stuff? Apparently facial scarring, like not intense facial scarring, but just a bit of facial scarring, just like a, just like a three, uh, like a, just a 30% facial scarring. Yes, Miriam Etelilana, you are finally in the live stream. Um, apparently facial scars make you more attractive to, well, I don't know if, I don't know if they were only looking at women's attractiveness to men, because I would, I would imagine that that might be different depending on the gender, right? Um, my guess would be that men wouldn't find women with facial scars more attractive. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But there was a study, apparently, I think, that said that men, women, men are more attractive to women when they have facial scars. I'm not advocating anyone to go out and, you know, get themselves, uh, <laughs> get themselves beaten up. Because uh, that in itself is... Or, all right, that, let's not go down that road anyway. Um, but we've got this wonderful sex description with all the glistening and all of the scars and all of all of this shit. Um, and it's very exciting. Um, and we learn that not only have Drogo and Daenerys... Um, yes, M, M, likes, M likes them not only physically scarred, but also emotionally scarred. That's uh, nice. Oh, yeah, the tattooed chick from Westworld. She was pretty scarred up, wasn't she? Um... Anyway, uh, so, yes, we've got glistening, we got whatever, and we learn that at the same time that Daenerys and Drogo have been having sex, they've also been having an important political discussion. So it's not only in the show that, um, that, the, that the showrunners decide to augment an otherwise dull political conversation with a bit of, with a bit of flesh flapping about on screen. Um, it's not only the showrunners who are guilty of that. George Martin likes to... Um, likes to give you some, you know, kaleidoscopic uh, skin, just sort of, just sort of dancing, just sort of dancing about in order to give you something to look at uh, while you have a political conversation. It's like all those YouTubers, uh, you know, all those YouTubers who like, they just talk about, you know, what happened to them last Thursday. Um, and, and they won't just do it in front of a camera. What they'll do is they'll play, they'll play a video game and they'll have like, um, they'll have footage. Remember when like, uh, the person I'm thinking of is Leafy. You know how, like, Leafy um, does these videos where he's, like, running around with a knife in, like, uh, Counter-Strike or something? But he's just talking about, like, going to the shops on the weekend, right? Um, which is 
which which seems like such a bizarre uh, combination of imagery, right? Like this guy's like, oh, I was so then I w- so then I went to Tesco uh, and I purchased some yarn uh, because I needed to uh, uh, knit a, a, a new trombone for for my sister. Um, and meanwhile, on screen, there's like someone like driving a jeep through an airport and and explode, and it's like, what's what's going on? What what's the disconnect? Uh, but the reason why this is relevant is that in the same way, in the same way that 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 YouTubers use random video game violence, George R. Martin uses titties and glistening manhoods. Same technique. It's just it's just giving your eyeballs something to to juice while you talk about politics, foreign policy, right? Um, uh, so, so, so we get a bit of foreign policy discussion. Uh, so basically Daenerys is saying, hey Drogo, uh, I've got a great idea, let's invade Westeros. It's gonna be great, um, uh, oh yeah, Radley Chin, it, you actually, you could follow along with Old Swift X with the book. If, if, if you all at home have a, a copy of a Game of Thrones lying around, uh, you could go and grab it and, and you could follow along. You could, you could correct me on on everything that I misread you could um you could uh you could you could rip out pages um and then mail them to a PO box um uh all right don't do that it's really distracting because I've got the chat box on one eye and I've also got yeah all right we might have a bit too many tangents mightn't we all right let's we're gonna get this track back on the train uh all right second different plan change of plan we're going to get the train on the tracks not the other way around that would be really confusing if you got the tracks on the train unless you put the tracks on the train and then you put a train on the tracks so you had a sort of like a train sandwich going on with the tracks in the middle but then trains either side i think that's a fair description of the sex scene we just witnessed with danny and drogo actually. But what's happening here is it's a... Con- I'm going to glance less at the chat because it's way too distracting. So there's a conversation happening between Daenerys and Drogo. Um, and Daenerys is saying, yo, Drogo, great idea, uh, invade the West. And Drogo's like, um, nah, I don't really feel like it because there's like an ocean, man. I don't like to get wet. You know how long it takes me to get this mustachio looking all pretty? Like, Drogo is clearly someone who cares about his image, let's be honest. He, he thinks more about his ponytail um, than most professional ponytail artists, um, of which I'm sure there are some, at least. Uh, Drog- Drogo loves his image. He doesn't want to get wet. He doesn't want to get damp. He doesn't want to cross the ocean in order to get to Westeros. He'd rather stay on land uh, where can, he can use his horses, right? The Dothraki, they love their horses. Um, they're like... They're like uh, <laughs> does, does anyone here know what the Saddle Club is? They're like those girls who are really into horses when they're growing up. They're they're horse fan girls, um, and so and so that's what Drogo is. That's what the Dothraki are. They they, they have little pony, uh, they have little pony dolls and stuff. It's like uh, Tina Tina Belcher in uh, Bob's Burgers, right? Like you know how like Tina. Um, oh wow, we're getting some saucy shit on the chat. It's like how Tina Belcher has all of her like um, dolls and stuff, right? Um, that's how, that's Drogo's relationship with horses as well. Um, but the point is that Drogo doesn't want to invade Westeros, but Daenerys does want him to invade Westeros because she wants to reclaim her ancestral seat and be queen of Westeros and all of that. Um, yeah, man, Cardinal Doomsday knows what Saddle Club is. You know. Um... And and he's like, no, nah, I don't want to cross the sea. He calls it the Black Salt Sea, the poison water. Because the main issue with the ocean is that horses can't drink from it. Uh, and, well, also horses just generally have a bad time with water. Horses are not well equipped um, to deal with water. Uh, unless you give them sort of like water wings. I mean, I suppose you could put a water wing on each of the four legs of a horse. Like, you know, those little floaties? You could put a little floaty underneath each, you know, leg of a horse, and then may- maybe they'd be able to manage it better. Or flippers. Uh, you could equip a horse with flippers. Um, that that might make it faster. They could go much faster than a human if they've got four flippers going at once, although I imagine it'd be quite difficult to get the directionality right with the four legs sort of flipping all over the place. It'd be a bit like a, uh, a squid, wouldn't it? You know how, like, squids have that sort of uh, ululating 
is that how you use that word? That that, that sort of... Anyway. Um, so Drogo doesn't want to cross the sea. Page two. Um, and and Danny's like, well, no, but there there are alternatives. Like you don't like you don't have to try and just just run the horses across the ocean. I'm not suggesting that you just that you just sprint across like the Flash. Like I'm the, I'm not suggesting that that's actually going to work. What I suggest is like a vessel, right? A vehicle. I know the Dothraki; they're not too big on vehicles. Um, but it is possible to to put a horse inside another box and 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 then push that across uh to another place without the horse even having to move you know you know how like you know it's like how you know how dogs right love getting in cars like you put oh it's smashed avo how you doing avo uh it's like how when you put a dog in a car he's like fuck this is the greatest this is i'm i'm moving at high speeds i'm high rolling i can stick my head out the window i can stick my head in the window Oh wow! Oh look at that digit digit four L hero. Oh thank you. Um, someone just did a donation. So that's the other exciting part about this uh, fancy new upgrade that we've got. Uh, whenever someone does a little donation through the chat, uh, we get we get a little ding, uh, and it means that I can actually oh <laughs> oh isn't that awesome? So they've also got the message and. Uh, and their message is uh, that they are live on time for a li- from a live stream from a live stream. Spank me, daddy. That is their message, and I will read out the message if you do the super chat donation thing, even if what your message is is spank me, daddy. Th- there can not possibly be any positive ramifications from that audio of me saying that being online now. But there you go. That's the deal. That's the wonders of technology. Uh, for a mere dollar on the interwebs, you can make me say things, um, in this voice, or in this voice, or in this voice. I'm not a voice artist. Um, but that's something that you can do. Actually, there was another thing that we could do, another game we could play, um, with this whole sort of setup. Do you guys know Twitch plays Pokemon? So there's this amazing... One of the great, like, postmodern, uh, anarchic, crazy, dystopian, fucking ridiculous things that's happening in this new century uh, is that people are collectively, with, like, hundreds of thousands of people together, are uh, playing Japanese video games from the 90s together. That's, like, the, the culmination of all these decades of technology and research. The reason why, the reason why we had an industrial revolution was for Twitch Plays Pokemon. The reason why we had an Enlightenment uh, was for Twitch Plays Pokemon. That, 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 that's what it was all leading towards. When, uh, who was the bloke, the, the, the Protestant guy, Martin Luther, when he went and nailed his 99 theses uh, onto that church door in, in 14-whatever, um, when he did that, there was actually a secret 100th thesis that, that most people don't know about. Um, but recently in an archaeological dig, they, they actually revealed uh, what this um, what this fabled 100th thesis is. And as it turns out, uh, the secret ultimate goal uh, of the entire Protestant Reformation uh, thing uh, was actually 1522? Was it 1522? I'm not sure. The actual goal of the Protestant Reformation uh, was to eventually develop and institute Twitch Plays Pokemon. It, it was all for Helix. It was all for Lord Helix, uh, or whatever. Uh, which is, uh, you know, surprising, shocking, uh, but, but, but here's the point. The point is that, uh, it's kind of cool and interesting for a, for a large group of people to collectively drive something, right? So in Twitch Plays Pokemon, people are collectively driving, uh, a, a Ash Ketchum or whatever, right? Um, I think it would be interesting if you all collectively tried to drive my brain, Okay, if you tried to drive Alt Swift X collectively, um, uh, you could keep me on the tracks. You could keep Alt Swift X on the tracks, or you could veer off a cliff if you chose to. Because the idea would be, I think, uh, that when you do a super chat donation thing and the little message comes up, the little message could say, uh, more tangent or less tangent. It's like how on Twitch Plays Pokemon they could vote for anarchy or for democracy. 
or whatever. Um, so you could do that for Alt Swift X. You could y- your message could be a vote for more tangents or less tangents. So we would either descend more or less into anarchy, uh, depending on on what your vote is. That's the idea. At the moment, I'd say we're we're pretty far in the direction of tangents. I'd say we've strayed slightly. Oh, wonderful! All right, here we go. So always blaze blazing thirteen sixty nine. Uh, wants to, oh, just wants me to say his name. Well, I'll do it twice. Always blazing, <laughs> what is it? Always blazing 1369. Thank you. Always blazing 1369 for your kind donation. Um, that's very nice of you. All right, but we're going to continue with the book, uh, because otherwise we're going to be here all day. Um, and, um, I know I said that time's an illusion, uh, but, uh, <laughs> the sun will eventually go down. Or rise, depending on where you are. If you're on the ISS, um, not to go on any more tangents or anything, but if you're on the ISS, do they do they follow the sun? Because cause they are like geosynchronous, aren't they? Is the, does the ISS stay on the same place over the Earth all the time? And if no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It moves over the Earth, doesn't it? Can any astrophysicists clarify, please? Anyway, but do you think the ISS does it follow the sun? What does the sun rise for the ISS the same way that it does on Earth? I, and yes, Cardinal Doomsday, I am sort of quoting forward a little bit. Anyway, um, we're going to move on with uh, with Daenerys, though. Um, oh, they pass every 92 minutes, apparently. They have sunrise every 40... F- Are you kidding me? Does the ISS have sunrise every 45 minutes? Is that true? I'm learning so much. It goes way faster. Yeah, so... Oh, they... So it goes bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark. Is that is that what's actually going on? Because that's ridiculous. Oh my god. All right. Um, well, let's just all be thankful that we're not. Um, oh, Lawn Gnome King thirty five. Uh, thank you very much, Lawn Gnome King thirty five. Your regal highness, your highness. Gnome King. Gnome King points out that we have a Discord group, and the link is on Facebook. All right, so someone has gone ahead and created a Discord group. Uh, thank you, uh, King King Gnome Man the First, uh, for for kindly leading us in the direction of the Discord. We'll, we'll 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 pin the comment after this stream. The YouTube video will go up, and then we'll pin the comment uh, of um, of where the Discord is and how you can find it and how you can join it, and that can be a little swifty place where people can swift up whenever they like um but anyway we, we, we we're gonna move on <laughs> with the chapter uh so basically um danny's trying to sell the concept uh of going going west with the dothraki instead of going east or going somewhere else and she's trying to explain to drogo the concept of <clears throat> boats and so she's basically like, or, all right, Drogo, here's the thing. Uh, you can put a horse inside this big box made of wood, because Drogo doesn't know what a ship is. Drogo doesn't know what a boat is. So, so Danny's like, you can put your horse inside a big, big water box and, and push the water box over to the land, and then you can get your horse out, and then you can keep on, keep on riding, man. And Drogo's like, oh, I don't know about that. But it's like how, you know, the guy who makes X, XKCD, uh, I think, uh, Randall Munro, he does, he has this book, uh, that's called, that's called Thing Explainer, um, and it's a big book that explains things, but it only does it using, like, the most common 10,000 words in the English language, or, or something like that, a very limited, simple vocabulary. So he explains space stations uh, and and cells, mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. He explains all those things, but without using the word mitochondria, without using the word station, without using any complicated words. And so and so he describes like spaceships as like space boat and 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 stuff. And he has all these and and it's hilarious, but it's also an amazing exercise in like good communication, simple communication, um, and effective communication. Uh, people are so often get over enthusiastic about in, about using big ass words that make them sound smart. Um, but but sometimes simple language gets points across good, you know. Um, so that's what Danny's trying to do with Drogo, uh, and she's trying to explain the concept of boats. And she's like, "All right, think of it this way: you can make a a, a box out of wood, 
uh, that it's like a horse. It's a horse that's made out of wood. It's a vehicle, and it can take you across the sea. Uh, oh, we've got we've got a new. How exciting! To and from the Danian uh, needs some camping advice. Wow. All right. Uh, well, you've come to the right place, Danian. Uh, is it Danian? The Danian. I wouldn't want you to get confused with any of those other Danians, because you're like, you're the direct article. Um, camping advice. All right. Step one, uh, slather yourself in honey. Uh, that's, that's the essential first step in any kind of camping expedition. Just get a big, like, get a large-ish size bath, uh, and, and just buy, uh, you can get, like, um, bulk, you can get these bulk, like, tubs of honey from, like, uh, Walmart, uh, and stuff that come by the litre, um, and fill up your bathtub with honey, and then just soak in there, you know, just, just, just roll around in the honey, um, uh, that's step one, and then step two, uh, you, you fill up a bag with all of the essential instruments that, that you'll need for your camping trip, um, uh, so, so that would include, uh, your, uh, your, uh, sextant, in case you get lost, um, you, in case you need to navigate by the stars, uh, or anything, um, and, uh, and you'll also need, uh, a fishing rod, uh, even if you're not going near any water, uh, you can always, um, tie insects to, to the string, and have them, like, fly around, it's like a dog on a leash, but it's an insect, so that can be done for entertainment, uh, and the final step uh, for a good camping trip um, is to bring um, is to bring uh, a real like expensive expensive food um, caviar uh, or something so that even if you're out in the middle of the outback you're in the middle of nowhere um, you'll at least have the feeling of luxury and the feeling of 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 uh, of, of creature comforts, you know, indoor comforts, even when you're in the great outdoors, all right? So, honey, sextant, caviar. Those are the three essential components of any camping trip. I do hope, Danian, that, that, uh, that Alt Shift X has been of assistance. Uh, so anyway, Danny's trying to explain about crossing the ocean, uh, and, and, Drogo's not convinced. Uh, he's like, all right, look, uh, you're talking about horses made of wood and oceans made of water. Like, none of that, none of that's okay. That's not appealing to my, uh, to my taste. Um, uh, I instead would like to go out and hunt. So, goodbye, woman. I'm out to go kill an animal. Uh, which is interestingly reminiscent of the relationship of Robert and Cersei isn't it? Because, like, Robert was always going out hunting. When Cersei was giving birth uh, to, to, uh, to Joffrey and Marcella and Tom, and Robert was off killing animals, because that, that was his preference. Um, and so it's interesting seeing parallels between Drogo, uh, Drogo and Daenerys and Robert and Cersei, because in some ways they are rather alike. Both of them were, both of them are blonde women who are married unwillingly to a strong martial man in a position of power, uh, that don't have a great conversation, don't, they, don't, they don't have a great verbal relationship. Oh, I've got a new donation. So, uh, Digit for Hero, is that what it says? Digit for Hero suggests putting a bridge on a podcast type app, um, uh, and also says, spank me, daddy. Digit, Digit for Hero, Digital Hero. Uh, thank you, Digital Hero. Uh, yes, uh, we could put Game of Thrones abridged on a podcast. I, I've, we've already got it up on Bandcamp. Uh, which is all of the episodes in full quality that can be streamed from the Bandcamp app, um, and it's a pay-what-you-like thing, so you can pay whatever you think this is worth, um, if anything, uh, and I think that's a good option, but yeah, I understand a podcast would also be pretty good too, but we can probably do both. Honestly, I don't know anything about running a podcast, um, I understand that it's a little more involved than just uploading things somewhere, you got to think about, like, hosting, uh, and stuff like that. And I'm reluctant to add another layer of sort of things to fiddle with. Um, but it's definitely a possibility. Because, um, yeah, I agree that it makes sense. Um, although this live streaming thing is, I, I think, increasingly what we're moving towards. Um, I think I think doing stuff like this also makes sense. And I think the live streaming thing is different to the podcasting thing. Uh, so, yeah, all right. So, Elizabeth Stefanovic uh, is complaining that the Bandcamp app is a crap app. Um, 
yeah, and Dylan for agrees. All right, well, I thought it was all right when I used it, but if 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 the people speak, uh, then sure, we don't need to push the Bandcamp thing. We can look into a podcast. Uh, probably all of this will happen after season seven, uh, probably, um, because there'll be other things going on in the future. Um, but we can, yeah, all right, we, we can look at other ways of distributing this madness in the future. Um, yeah, what is what is CHF? as a as a currency i don't what i've never heard of chf what is that does anyone can anyone tell me what chf is um is it like zimbabwean or something i don't know um anyway so where where drogo's going off to hunt uh, oh swiss francs is chf swiss francs oh okay interesting switzerland They've got mountains there, I understand. And assault rifles? Don't they also have a lot of assault rifles in Switzerland? I'm not too familiar. Uh, but thank you for the information. Uh, and we are discussing Drogo's hunting trip. So Drogo's going on, out on a hunting trip. And of course, hunting trips are very similar uh, to camping trips. So I, I do hope that Drogo's got his honey sextant uh, and um, <clears throat> fishing rod. Um, and so he goes out into the grass and hunts. And yes, there certainly are similarities between Robert and Cersei's relationship to Danny's and Drogo's. Um, and so Drogo's goal is to go and get a Hracha, uh, which is a great... <laughs> yes, I know you're theorizing that Alt Swift X is not from Switzerland. Maybe that was just what I want you to think. Maybe that was a false flag, and I'm as Swiss as they come. I'm made of that cheese, man. Or is that story full of holes? Fuck, that was dumb. Um, so Drogo wants to go and kill a Hraka, which is a great white lion. It's a kind of a lion that has, like, white fur. Uh, it's like a shiny Pokemon. Are there any lion-type Pokemon? Um, I, I, I don't think so. Is that, like, the last animal that Nintendo hasn't thought of to make a Pokemon out of? Because so far they've got, like, um, uh, they've got, like, washing machine Pokemon and sword Pokemon, um, and ice cream Pokemon, I think. Um... So they're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. I'm assuming that at this, I'm assuming that they've got a lion already. Like if you're going down to, hey, it's, it's not a stereotype. Swiss che Swiss cheese does come from Switzerland. I'm, that's not. That's not. Anyway, uh, so you'd think that if they're doing like washing machine Pokemon, they would have done lions. Yeah, Persian. The, well, that's more of a cat, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, a pyroar. Lux Luxray. Okay, apparently there are lion Pokemon. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad we've established that. Uh, a lot of legendaries are, like, multiple? Fuck, Pokemon's moved on since I've been paying attention, hasn't it? Um, alright, so Drogo's out to kill a Pokemon. Although, of course, Pokemon don't die, they just faint. Um, so how do you get a skin off a Pokemon? Because Drogo's goal is to get, uh, a skin off this Hraka, uh, off this white lion. Um, how do you make a carpet out of a Pokemon if it only faints? Do you just have to lie it on the ground and use it as a carpet while it's still just sort of unconscious? Like, do you just have to sort of put your dining table on top of an unconscious uh, lion or Luxray, as it may be? I, I imagine that would actually be more comfortable because it would still be, you know, like, it would be just, it would be warm. Oh, Christ, that's morbid. Um, yeah, don't do that. Don't, don't use living animals as furniture. Um... Okay, so now that we've established that, Drogo decides to go out and hunt. Uh, and Daenerys thinks that, well, maybe when Drogo returns uh, from the hunt, uh, he'll listen to her suggestion uh, to go and sail west uh, and conquer Westeros. Uh, and, so, and so what we're witnessing here is like an example of like female soft power in Westeros. Uh, not in Westeros, in Essos. Um, most places in the world of ice and fire are like patriarchal in that it's generally only men who are allowed to hold like official, visible, outward signs of power. People follow uh, the orders of, of men who are wearing crowns nine times out of ten as opposed to the orders of women. But women can have influence in more subtle ways in a lot of these fictional societies uh, and in their analogous non-fictional societies. Um, and one of the ways that they can have this sort of influence is by just wheedling in the ear of their husbands. Um, the queens, the princesses, the ladies who get married to these male aristocrats, or indeed in this case this Dothraki warlord, um, 
can influence the the major political decisions of their husbands, like Drogo. Because what we're talking about here is, you know, should we go and conquer that continent over there, right? Like, it's a pretty big deal whether or not Drogo conquers Westeros. Um, but Daenerys uh, is able to influence significantly that decision by whispering in his ear while they're making love, right? Um, like like Grimmer Wormtongue, but much, much sexier. Um, that's what Daenerys is like. Um, and savage beasts are not something that Drogo fears. He's out to kill a, kill a lion, uh, and he's not too afraid of doing such a thing, uh, but the sea is something that really upsets him. The Dothraki are very superstitious and hateful towards the sea. Um, so of all, of all, of all Drogo's courage, he doesn't want to deal with the ocean. Um, and Danny, meanwhile, uh, heads off to be dressed by her, uh, handmaidens, uh, and she's feeling very fat and ungainly at the moment, uh, because she's pregnant, right? She, and she's very young as well, um, so I can only imagine that the changes that pregnancy brings on your body would be a lot more... Um, would feel a lot more intense when you're so young, like you've barely gone through puberty and then there's a bloody sprog growing inside of you. That's um, got to be unpleasant. Uh, and so she's feeling a bit sort of clumsy and, and gross, and so her handmaidens help her wash and get her clothes on, uh, and then she decides to have a little outing. Uh, but first she sends Jiqui, who is one of her handmaidens, to go get Jorah Mormont, uh, the man of the Knight of Bear Isle. Um, and so Jorah Mormont is wearing horsehair leggings and a painted vest, just like a Dothraki rider. Um, actually, that is a very good point, uh, Slade Wilson, that Drogo, the same actor, is playing Aquaman in these new superhero movies. It's, it's pretty ironic that he's playing Aquaman when Drogo, his Game of Thrones character, uh, is deathly afraid of the sea. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful wonderful irony. It's like if uh, Daenerys went on and played Mr. Freeze or something, or someone who was very into cold weather as opposed to Daenerys's Targaryen fire, right? She's just, she's playing the anathema of, um, of her other character. Um, thank you, Miriam El... El... Et, et, el, et el Mina. Miriam Etelmina. Nice name. Uh, Miriam says that it's hot and she is making cucumber and tomato salad. Oh shit, we've got a meta food description, folks. Cucumber and tomato salad. Is there grease running down your chin, Miriam? Is there is there uh, trenches and, and bread uh, and, and stuffed peacocks and pigeon pie? That might go well with your cucumber and tomato salad. I would, I would suggest uh, you make the addition of those courses. That'd be pretty yum. Um... Thank you for your donation, uh, and for your food description. Um, man, this is exciting. <laughs> All right, so, so, there's, uh, so, so we're learning that Jorah is wearing Dothraki clothing, uh, which is, like, smart, right? Like, Viserys, in contrast, was wearing his old, like, shitty silks and stuff, um, which is just completely inappropriate for, for the Dothraki sea and for the Dothraki lifestyle. Jorah, uh, on the other hand, is, is totally adaptable and totally willing to, to, to shed his skin and wear a new, uh, wear new raiment that's more appropriate for the situation. He's like, uh, he's like, a, he's like Mystique in X-Men. He's like a chameleon. He'll just blend into his environment, you know? He'll just, he's like, uh, he's like that lizard man in, in Monsters, Inc., you know? If, if he's standing in front of a tartan skirt, bam, he becomes tartan, you know? If he's standing in front of a Hawaiian shirt, it's a colourful kaleidoscope, you know? If he goes to Yeezy Season 3, he, it's just mud. He's just the, he's just brown. He's just the colour of, uh, not because of the, because that's the colour of Yeezy's fashion line, mostly. It's all very muted uh, browns and things. A bit like the Dothraki. Dothraki clothing, uh, in the show at least, is all quite, um, quite sim- is, is mostly just sort of browns of various flavours and shades and colours. Um, maybe Kanye took inspiration from the Dothraki. That seems a distinct possibility. We can't rule it out. Um, anyway, so... Jorah is a shapeshifter, we've established that, um, and Jorah is uh, being complained to by Daenerys, Daenerys is complaining that Drogo doesn't seem to want to go west, um, and and Jorah's explaining, or Jorah's, uh, 
Jor, he's not he's not Jor explaining. He's just sort of suggesting his viewpoint, which is that. Uh, well, Drogo probably doesn't really understand what it is that you're suggesting. Like, when you say, yo, you should go invade Westeros, Drogo probably thinks that Westeros is, like, a bunch of, like, random little islands, um, you know, a few small cities, like, nothing very large. Drogo doesn't really have any conception of what, like, you know, a gigantic, diverse, rich continent Westeros is. Uh, because, of course, you know, there are distances involved there, involved here, and they haven't got Wikipedia yet. Drogo can't just go, Siri, uh, what's the GDP of Westeros? And then Siri just goes, it's a, it's a trillion gold dragons, yo. Um, can't happen. Drogo's just got to rely on, like, hearsay in order to find out what Westeros is. Um, so he hasn't really got an understanding of what the place is like. But Danny's like, no, but it's so important. It's so important that we need, uh, Drogo to go west and conquer Westeros, um, because, because she feels like that's her home and she feels like that's her destiny. So even though she's kind of rejected Viserys for being, you know, uh, an unrepentant cunt, uh, Daenerys has not rejected, uh, Viserys's goal and, and ideology and his desperation to go west as a Targaryen and continue the Targaryen legacy, uh, and, and take over Westeros, which was always Viserys's goal. So it's interesting that, you know, Daenerys has been selective here. You'd think that in rejecting Viserys, uh, and, and, you know, his death and having him symbolically no longer be his brother. When Viserys died, Danny was thinking, he is not my brother anymore. Um, she, she let go of him as a part of her life, but she did not let go of his dream of conquering Westeros. Uh, which, you know, if, if, if she did, we might all be a bit better off, or at least, you know, Daenerys might be, um, because she never would have gone through all of the trials and hardships that she'd gone through over the next five books, and then Westeros wouldn't have to deal with three bloody dragons flying around in Westeros. Um, the conquest probably isn't helpful for anyone, honestly, Daenerys's conquest. Um, but she's decided that, no, we've got to, uh, We've got to shed some blood, and I've got to be queen. Uh, so Daenerys is describing her relationship with Westeros and how she believes that it's a home and she feels a connection, even though she's never been there and she's never seen Westeros. And then Jorah says, I promise you, Daenerys, I promise that we will go home to Westeros. Um, which, on the one hand, is like, wow, you know, you go, girl, Jorah. You, you go, you go, Jorah, girl. You go, Sheba. Um, because cause you're being so encouraging to your to your little teenage friend who you have a, a creepy crush on. Um, and on the other hand, Jorah, what are you doing for making a promise that you can't possibly know you're ever going to be in any position to keep? Uh, wh- what does Jorah, why is Jorah so sure that he's going to be able to help, be, he's going to be able to help uh, Danny get to Westeros? And is that even in anyone's interest? interests. Because uh, one of the real deep things that's probably going on here from Jorah's perspective is that we know that Jorah regards Westeros as his home. He's from Bear Island. He's a Mormont and he was exiled, uh, or rather he fled Westeros for the crime of selling slaves. Uh, and so Jorah also dreams of returning home. And indeed, he's been spying on Daenerys for Varys in the hopes of getting a pardon and being able to return home to Westeros. So when when Jorah promises Daenerys, I promise we will go home to Westeros, is he saying that for Danny? Or is he more saying that for him? Just, just, uh, just put that in your thought box and 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 chew. Um, so then, Daenerys reflects on the nature of home for her, uh, and she thinks about uh, the 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 house with the red door, which is a place that Daenerys considers to be her home, uh, which was in Bravos, though some conspiracy theorists believe it is in Dawn or elsewhere. Um, and uh, Daenerys thinks, all right, what is my destiny then? What is my future? Like, I want to believe that it's Westeros, but what's the alternative? Uh, if I go by the Dothraki way, then once I'm done with being a Khaleesi, uh, I'm going to have to go join the Dosh Kaleen, the crones who live in Vase Dothrak. Um, that's the alternative. So that, so that kind of reveals that there's definitely a pragmatic angle to Daenerys deciding to go and invade Westeros. Um, it isn't just that she's pulled towards wanting, uh, Westeros and, and the Targaryen legacy, she's also pushed away from the whole Dothraki thing because she hates the idea, uh, of being a crone in Vase Dothrak for the rest of her life, which is probably something that we could all agree is not too appealing. Um... And she's thinking about home, and then Jorah says, oh, there's a caravan, a great big caravan full of all of these traders and merchants has arrived um, here at Vase Dothrak. Um, I'm going to go and check the post, I think. Um, 
Oh, we're not up to that yet, though, because uh, we mention the Valyrian language. We mention how that now that Drogo's gone, Daenerys doesn't feel obliged uh, to ride a horse uh, to get around anymore. She can be carried instead uh, upon a litter. Um, because the Dothraki and Drogo expect Daenerys to continue riding a horse, even though she's pregnant. Um, uh, and and speaking from personal experience, I can tell you that riding a horse while pregnant is really uncomfortable. Um, uh, Daenerys doesn't enjoy riding a horse while pregnant, and so she's like, all right, great, now that Drogo's gone, I'm not going to embarrass him if I instead choose to lie upon soft cushions and be carried across Faye's Dothraki. So she is. She gets carted around by her handmaids, sitting back like a piece of bloody cargo in a FedEx, but much more comfortable. Um, so Daenerys is living it pretty cushy, you got to admit. Like, I mean, compare this to our other hero, uh, Jon Snow. Jon Snow is living at the Wall in, like, this military outpost on the edge of the world, fighting zombies. And Daenerys, our fire hero, meanwhile, is being literally carried about on a cushioned litter, um, just enjoying and relaxing. Um, which which is a fair contrast. A lot of people complain about Daenerys going like, okay, I admit I wasn't pregnant. A lot of people are questioning in the comments. Alt, Alt Swift X was never pregnant. That was a fib. Sometimes there are fibs on this show, and you, you investigators have correctly detected um, the truth. Swift was never pregnant. Um, or oh, was that a false flag? Um, so they go into the market and they pass through the God's Way with all of the stolen monuments. Uh, and Daenerys wonders if the gods of burned cities can still answer prayers. There's a great, there's a great, um, oh, you, you think my voice sounds too deep to be a woman? What if I'm using a voice modulator? What if, what if it's just on a dial? There's just like a knob that I can turn and the voice goes down like this and then it goes up like this and then it goes down like that. Maybe, maybe it's all fake. Who knows? Um, and so, fib. Fib's a good word, Cardinal Doomsday. Um, and so she's going off to the market on a cushioned red silk litter. She's just sitting back. You know, um, th- the best thing in Futurama, not to do any sort of a tangent, but the best thing in Futurama is, uh, I think he's called, uh, oh, he's called Something Bot. Someone tell me in the comments what he's called. He's like that golden robot who, instead of being built to perform some kind of manual labor, like Bender, like Bender makes so much sense. He's a robot who was designed to bend things. Um, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, this, this, what's he called? It's like indulgence bot. It, there's a word for indulgence. What, what's, the, what's the term for like the philosophical solipsism? There, there's a word... Come on, guys, give me in the comments. It's it's the golden robot who... who hedonism bot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Callum. Hedonism bot. Hedonism bot is the best thing... Is it hedonism bot? It might be a synonym. But something like hedonism bot is... he He's been built not to perform a task, uh, but to uh, feel pleasure. Like, because he's a robot who is reclining on, like, this on, like, this couch, which is, like, the form of the robot. Um, and he just sits there eating grapes all the time. Um, and, and that is, is, is the function for which this robot was constructed. Robots are normally tools to bend or to, or to carry or to scrape or to build, but this robot is a tool made to experience pleasure, which is, which is such a great philosophical funny little thing on so many ways. Like, I mean, if, for example, you're a utilitarian, right? If you're a utilitarian and you believe that uh, the greatest possible world is one which maximizes uh, pleasure or perhaps, you know, just quote-unquote fulfillment or moral good or, or whatever your idea is, but, it, but let's say it's pleasure if, if you believe that maximizing worldwide pleasure is the ultimate goal of anything, um, then, yeah, you would just build a whole bunch of hedonism pots, right? You'd just make a giant server farm. I mean, you wouldn't even have to give them a body, right, if it was more efficient. You could just run a program, which, and, and, the, and the, all the code is, the code just says, experience pleasure equals yes, and it would just have a great time. It would just be a little bit of JavaScript that just sits there going, Yay! All the time, you know? Um, and you just you just build hundreds of server farms, the entire internet, you just fill them up with all these little AIs that just sit there having a great time. And that would be the perfect world, 
you know, that would be the good life, that would be utopia, um, from a certain utilitarian perspective, maybe. Uh, and that is why Futurama is good. Um, so anyway, Danny's being carried around like hedonism bot, uh, and she goes to the market, and she's reflecting, while she's being carried, uh, she's reflecting upon her Targaryen nature, um, and she does think about how, well, you know, apart from the old, apart from the old, um, Hogwarts, oh, oh god, my, my, it's, alright, I've got to look at the chat less, I'm sorry, but I've got to look at the chat, chat less, because you just incepted my brain with the word Hogwarts, uh, for no reason. Uh, and so Daenerys is thinking about her Targaryen nature, and she's going like, well, you know, I, I feel like it's not my choice, I'm a Targaryen by birth, I'm a Targaryen by nature, I can't be any other way, and that's why I can't be wholly wedded, um, to this whole, uh, Dothraki thing. Uh, because she thinks about how, like, you know, apart from the whole having to be a crone of Vase Dothrak, Dosh Kaleen thing, apart from that... The whole Dothraki lifestyle that she's living is actually pretty good. She's being carried around on silk cushions, she's got a husband who she actually kind of likes now, um, and she's got all these handmaidens, and she's got all these warriors keeping her safe, and she's got all these people looking after her, and she's pregnant, and she's really looking forward to having a son who's going to go conquer the world, and what mother doesn't want to have a son who goes conquer the world? Um, so she's feeling like, man, I'm kind of living the good life with this whole Dothraki thing, but she's like, eh, at the end of the day, I've... I I've got to do the Targaryen thing. I've got to go follow in the footsteps of my of my mad father and my loopy brother. Um, which seems like a terrible line of reasoning, right? Like, why can't Danny just be satisfied with like the comfortable life that she's got with the Dothraki? Why does she insist on starting wars in order to claim a continent she's never visited? I mean, sure. I mean, if you were Daenerys, right? If you were Daenerys in her situation. Would you want to go start a war in a foreign continent, or would you be like, eh, maybe I'll stick with my nice husband and my, 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 my cushy cushions and my handmaidens and peel grapes like hedonism, but why can't I just sit here and have a nice life? Well, Daenerys aspires to something higher, and it's good to aspire for something higher, but uh, does it have to involve bloodshed? Does it have to involve conquest and starting a war? Surely, surely it shouldn't. Um, that's just, that's just what I think, anyway. Um, and so, they're in the Western market, um, and, uh, we get a description, almost as much as, almost as good as a food description, of what the market's like. Uh, so there are animal pens, and mud, mud-baked brick, uh, and, and crooked alleyways, and storerooms, and it's fairly empty, compared to the busy bazaars that Danny has seen in other places. Uh, because Danny's actually been around, Danny's actually travelled, um, so Danny's been to a lot of the free cities up in like Lys and Bravos and Mir and Tyrosh and Pentos. Like Danny's actually seen a fair bit of Essos in her childhood as she was wandering from place to place. Um, uh, but this this market in Vase Dothraki is one of the relatively more empty ones um, because the Dothraki aren't huge on commerce, as it turns out. Uh, in fact, the Dothraki don't even really understand money. They're not really interested in money. They do a bit of bartering, we learn, um, but they're not that into commerce themselves. They're not about to start a stock market. We're not about to see Dothraki Wall Street anytime soon. We're not about to have Leo DiCaprio running around in Vase Dothrak snorting coke out of people's orifices um, due to all this money stuff that's going on. Uh, Dothraki prefer to keep things tangible. You know, they're not going to invest money in stocks that they can't see, and they're not going to invest soldiers into a conquest of a continent that they can't see. You know? Uh, Dothraki like uh, to trade in things that they can touch, which is fair enough. Uh, but some trade does happen at Vase Dothrak from foreign people from like Essos and stuff who do choose to do a bit of trading there. Um, and uh, the Eastern Market is where some of the like fruitier, more foreign stuff is. Uh, so there's stuff like uh, tree eggs and locust pie and green noodles that can be seen at the Eastern Market, which sounds a bit like a Dr. Zeusian uh, sort of a sort of a food description. I do not like green noodles, uh, Daenerys. I am um, locust pie. Almost uh, evokes the um, the honeyed locusts that are later used in an attempt to poison ter- uh, to poison Daenerys in Marine. Locusts. Someone needs to go control F and look at all of the mentions of locusts in Game of Thrones, because if you piece them together, uh, it actually reveals a vast conspiracy by the Locust King, uh, who's actually manipulating things from afar. A bit like the, um, 
the gnome king uh, who donated earlier he's he's also manipulating events from afar i see he and the uh, locust king are pretty tight um and we get a description of all of the places that the people come from uh, in the Eastern Market. Um, and so there are people from Ashai, shadowy Ashai, and there are people from Yi Ti, uh, which is basically China. And there are warrior maids from places called Bayasabad, Shamirana, and Kayakayanaya. Kayakayanaya. Uh, I'm not being culturally insensitive, because that's a fictional culture. Uh, and so there are all these different places. There are also there are also the shadow men, who are dour and frightening, and who are covered in tattoos, and they wear masks over their faces. Do you think the shadow men might be a little bit sinister? Do you think that's possible that they might be plotting something behind those? Ma- or maybe they're just really friendly guys who just feel insecure and they just wanna you know, put on a (laughs) literal mask of fearsomeness uh, by pretending to be all scary with all the tattoos. I think that's often why uh, men get those fearsome tattoos of, you know, eagles across the chest and snakes along the arms and and, and Dobermans on, on the ears and ferrets on the ankles and crocodiles on the wrists and capybaras on the tonsils. All this menagerie of animals that men get inked on their bodies. I think they sometimes do that in order to feel scarier. You know, they want to feel more menacing and more masculine and more, you know, the, the, not, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but there are ways of doing it that don't involve having to draw a zoo on you. Not to disparage anyone's decisions. Do what makes you happy. Um, and so there are all these flavors and scents and different things going on. Uh, at the Eastern Market, there's the odors of garlic and pepper. We get a whole other food description. Um, and there's Moorish lace, all these goods that are being traded here. Uh, there's Lannisport Goldwalk out here, which is interesting. Um, so we see that even here, like a whole continent and a half away, uh, the gold of Casterly Rock, of the Lannisters, has made it all the way to Vase Dothrak to be traded. Uh, So it's interesting that on the one hand, you know, they haven't got Wikipedia, there's not a lot of globalization going on uh, in the world of ice and fire as such, Uh, but but trade goods do cover a fair distance. We've got gold crossing like halfway across the world in order to be sold uh, at Vase Dothrak. I guess, I guess I guess that was a thing, wasn't it? They did have big trade routes and stuff moving across the planet uh, at various times. There was, like, the Silk Road and stuff that went across, like, half Eurasia, didn't it? Um, not an expert, but it's a thing, I guess. Um, and so there's all these different exciting goods uh, at the market. Uh, the people from Yi Ti wear hats with monkey tails on them. Um, and... Uh, lots of people laughing and hanging out and having a good time. Um, and Danny, Danny enjoys being around here. She has some memories uh, of uh, being in markets as a child in the various free cities. Uh, and she used to eat uh, sausages and she used to eat honey fingers. Ooh, do you think they have any honey fingers here, Jora? She says. Some honey fingers. That honey fingers are great. Um, it sounds as though honey fingers are, are basically the lemon cakes of, of Daenerys, like honey cakes are to Daenerys as lemon cakes are to Sansa. It's like the, it's like the Szechuan teriyaki sauce, uh, from Rick and Morty of, um, of Daenerys, uh, and Sansa, I think. Their, their season arc, their, their MacGuffin, their holy grail that they are questing to find. Ultimately, all Sansa wants is lemon cakes. All Daenerys wants is... Honey fingers. They they do sound cute, don't they? Honey fingers. They sound um they sound like a kid's a kid's uh treat of some kind. They sound like um uh something you, you you'd give to your kid if they aced the uh the grade seven maths weekly test or something. Uh, have a honey finger, mate. Gold star, a a plus. Good on you, mate. Um, honey fingers all over it, mate. Um, and. Uh, and Jorah, 
Joram, meanwhile, is like, uh, "Honey cakes. Look, uh, um, look. Do, do, do what you want, but I'm not. I'm not interested. Really, I've got more important things to do. I'm Jora. I I like swords. Uh, and and being gruff and hairy. Uh, and having crushes on girls decades younger than I am. Uh, and I have no time for honey cakes. Look at my face. Does this look like the face of a man who cares for honey fingers?" or lemon cakes. My wife, her name was Lanice Hightower. Hightower, and I was so in love with her, because she was so pretty, but she wanted all these expensive things all the time. She wanted her, she wanted a house built of honey cakes. She wanted, she wanted a bathroom built of lemon fingers. She, she, she wanted like the whole gingerbread get-up, you know, she wanted her, her path to be paved with skittles. You know, she wanted her, her firewood to be all made of those chocolate flakes, like those flake candy bars. She wanted her place to be insulated with marshmallows. And I was trying to tell her that, look, Lanesse, you can't just build things out out of out of confectionery. That, that's not appropriate architecture. The council rates will, will, will be over the top. If, if if we try and build out of sugar, like the birds, like the bears will come and just lick our house into non-existence. It's just not a sustainable architectural solution, Linus. And she was like, "But that's 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 what I want." And then and then Jorah's like, "Okay, I'll go and sell slaves in order to get you your ridiculous request." And that's how how Smallmont went to shit. It's that simple. Um, and so Jorah's like, I'm not interested in your talk of honey fingers. I've got to go and get the mail. Um, so we learn a little bit about the sort of, uh, Westerosi, uh, postage situation. Um, so, so Jorah's off to get some, some post that he's expecting. And the way that this has happened is that the merchants are apparently carrying some mail from Illyrium Apatis because they passed by Pentos. Um, and I suppose they, they must have been specifically paid, uh, in order to carry this message, so it seems to be a sort of an improvised postal service, uh, which can't possibly be very reliable. Uh, in Westeros, at least, they have, like, the ravens carrying messages, which seems to work fairly well when they don't get when they don't get shot down. In Essos, we don't know much about the postal system, uh, but apparently these random merchants are willing to carry shit for people. And, and, and Danny's like, oh, I'll come and check the mailbox with you, it'll be great. Um, and, whoa, uh, Miss Miwisroar just subscribed. Miwisroar. Welcome. Uh, we've got, we've got a, we've got a zombie gif that appears when someone subscribes. Um, I think that's just like the default image, uh, on, uh, on Streamlab or whatever it's called. Uh, I think we'll have to change that. I'm not sure if a zombie gif is really on theme. Uh, if anyone's got a suggestion of a nice little graphic or image that might be nice to pop up, to pop up, uh, whenever someone, uh, subscribes or donates or does any of those things, uh, do comment and we can, uh, dig it up because I, I think the undead, uh, well, I guess an undead, I mean, the whites, the zombies, the white walkers, that's, yeah, you're right. You're right, Swallow the Cloud, it's basically a white. Um, uh, so yeah, maybe that is appropriate. Yeah, we could, we could use a dragon or something. A greasy chin, I'd love to have a greasy chin pop up every time someone subscribes. That'd be amazing. Uh, Sir Pounce would be cool, a Pokemon pop up. Uh, Homo sapiens. Welcome, Homo sapiens. We're welcoming an entire species uh, to this channel all at once. All Homo sapiens are welcome here. Homo floriariensis, though, the hobbits, the... Oh god, we're getting a lot of these dings, aren't we? Is this just kicking in now, the subscribing thing? Well, in any case, welcome Atlas32, uh, and enjoy your, um, your zombie gear. <laughs> Well, oh god, we're gonna have to turn this off, aren't we? Vemto Mc, Mc, how do you say that? Vemto McGinsey Kell Pump? I love the name, but it's very hard to say. Um, but hey, whatever floats your vote. Uh, thank you for subscribing, everyone. And I think we might have to turn off the ding, because it might... Oh, people are unsubscribing and subscribing. Homo sapiens, you deceptive. You, you, you schemer. Homo sapiens unsubscribed and subscribed. Doesn't that say everything you need to know about our species? You know, our species is willing to just bend the rules. Bagger999. Alright, I really shouldn't have said that you can subscribe then unsubscribe as a way of... <laughs> 
<laughs> as a way of dinging up onto the screen. So before this gets out of control and everyone starts subscribing and unsubscribing in order to just, you know, break the internet like Kim, D Kim Kardashian's butt, uh, we're going to have to turn off the uh, subscription uh, ding, I think. So if I can quickly do that before we're overrun uh, and I save settings and then I press the buttons and okay, I think I've disabled it and we will no longer be plagued by zombies. We've averted the long night. We've prevented the zombies from spreading across Alt Swift X. Um, and, and we've saved the day. Azora High has come, and with his flaming sword, uh, has has cleansed the realm of the undead uh, who were tr who were threatening to take over uh, the the channel. Um, oh, is Hairless Oyster here? Ah, oh, welcome, Hairless Oyster. Oyster, I suppose you're a bit confused by the timing situation. I was just explaining earlier that um that time is subjective. Uh, and that we shouldn't we shouldn't feel like we need to like follow its uh, its its rules, you know. Um, Smash Davo will fill you in. Um, but I do like that we just averted the long night symbolically. We just sort of accidentally, organically uh, caused the White Walker invasion with the whites, uh, and then we saved it with a quick fiddling of the system settings on the stream. If only in Game of Thrones they could avert the long night zombie apocalypse by just tweaking some system settings. Um, that, that would make the whole Song of Ice and Fire saga rather easier. And we didn't have to sacrifice a Nissa Nissa. Um, or maybe Nissa Nissa was that Gnome King from before. I'm sorry, I'm gonna remember those of you who donate who have funnier names. Um, so, so that's just, that's, that's just gonna be part of it. Um, so, we're talking about Lemon Fingers, and then we're talking about, uh, Jorah going off to get the mail. And it's a bit suspicious, because Jorah's going like, I'll go and check, I'll go and check the post box, Daenerys. And Daenerys is like, oh, well, why don't I come along? I love post. I, I'm not even afraid of the paper cuts. I'm, I, I'm the blood of the dragon, and, and paper cuts cannot kill a dragon. And Jorah's like, uh, well, I appreciate, uh, your, your enthusiasm, Daenerys, and your, and your honey fingers and such, but I'm off to do important manly bear business, uh, and dragons can't come along on bear business. This is between me and Winnie the Pooh, okay? Me, Winnie the Pooh, Humphrey B. Bear, we're gonna go off, do some bear business, and what happens in the woods amongst the bears stays in the woods amongst the bears. And Daenerys is like, oh, well, all right, you go and do your bear business. I'm not offended that you're going off to do your bear business without me. Um, and so Jorah stalks off to go to the post box. And Daenerys is like, why? Why didn't he want me to come? What's his bear business? What? Why can't I come and check the post? Um, and... And Jorah's just, yeah, Jorah's just stomped off. And so Daenerys is like, oh, well, maybe, maybe Jorah's off to get laid. Maybe he's off to find a woman. Uh, he know, uh, Daenerys knows that there are prostitutes that come along with the caravans. And she theorizes, she hypothesizes that the bear is off to find a she-bear to go and mate with. And she thinks that, oh, isn't it funny how some men are so shy about their couplings? So Daenerys thinks that it's strange that Jorah is trying to hide and Jorah is being all sheepish about his bear business. Um, mixed metaphors. Sorry, Jorah is a bear, not a sheep, but he's being sheepish about his sex. Uh, uh, and um, Daenerys thinks that's weird, which is kind of interesting. Like, Daenerys has, like, this open attitude to sex, and perhaps the reason why is because uh, Daenerys's introduction to sex was with Drogo, who was in the Dothraki culture, and the Dothraki apparently are very open about sex. They talk about how the Dothraki will just mate and couple just out in the open field, uh, like horses do. They'll just do it in the open. Um, or at least they did in the specific case at uh, Daenerys' wedding or whatever. Um, people just have sex in public because that's just how they get down. And so that's what Daenerys' idea of, like, normal sexuality is. Uh, so anyone who has the prudish notion of going, you know, into a private place in order to do a bit of bare business with the sheep, um, she thinks is weird. So what do you think will happen when she comes to Westeros and she becomes Queen of Westeros? Will she just be out in the Red Keep courtyard, just, you know, bouncing around on Dario, having a, having a good old time? Because um, she won't have the same sexual mores as Westeros. And, you know, that'll apply to everything else as well, right? So Daenerys, uh, I mean, she grew up mostly in Essos, but she's also done, amongst the Free Cities, but she's also doing, done a lot of growing up um, 
She's also, she's also done a lot of growing up among the Dothraki, which means she's uh, taken in a lot of their uh, mores and a lot of their values and a lot of their customs, which includes some things like it's totally normal to plunder and rape and steal uh, and go to cities and just take everyone's shit. It's totally normal to have slaves. Daenerys has grown, has grown up among the Dothraki in a culture that thinks that slaves are totally normal. So you'd think there'd be a risk of her importing that idea to Westeros. But, but huh, Swift, you say. Hold up, Swift. Uh, because Daenerys is actually opposed uh, to slavery. She's she's vehemently, vehemently opposed to slavery. And so she won't be importing those values to Westeros. But, oh, I say again, King Gnome. Um, King, King Gnome's name is now analogous for the whole just sort of general audience. Uh, King Gnome, uh, I, I say, uh, well, here's the thing. Daenerys might say that she's the breaker of chains. She might see herself as a liberator, as an Abraham Lincoln of of Essos. Um, but she is leading a slave army, you know, the Unsullied. But, but oh, Swift, you say. Uh, she freed the Unsullied. She said that the Unsullied could go home if they want. So they are free men. They're not slaves at all. Um, but here's the thing. These kids, the Unsullied... They were indoctrinated from a very young age in order to have complete and total obedience, to have no life, no value, no understanding uh, beyond fighting and obedience and following orders. Do you really think that just because some foreign blondie turns up and says, you're all free men now, abandon all of the values that you've had indoctrinated in you from birth, just shake off that brainwashing and go off and become free spirits... Do you think just because someone tells that to you, you'll suddenly become a fully autonomous, independent person? I, I doubt it. That's like walking into the into the Scientology club and saying, like, you know all the stuff about the 52 superpowers that you get out, out of donating to Xenu and, and, and getting the little, the special hat and the little wristband that says that my, my, my chakra is all up in the, in the chi. Just because you go up and say, Xenu isn't real, do, that doesn't really remove the ideology from someone's head necessarily. So even though Daenerys might tell herself that all her Unsullied are totally free men who can, who are free to do whatever they choose to do, I think the Unsullied are probably, to a larger extent, uh, still slaves. Um, so I, I'm not so sure about Daenerys having totally uh, 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 refused the idea of slavery anymore. I think Daenerys is in some ways still a slaver. Um, but back on track, keeping this steam train moving, uh, Danny's like, all right, whatever, Jorah can go off and do his bear business, I've got some dragon business, I'm gonna hang out, uh, at the market, and I'm gonna find some motherfucking lemon cakes, uh, or honey fingers, um, and so, and so they go off with, she goes off with her handmaidens, um, and, and Danny insists that they join her for a sausage, um, what, what, how's that phrase go? Seen enough hentai to know where this is... Yeah, the sausages. Um, so they so they get up and busy with the sausages, uh, and apparently the sausages are made of horse meat instead of pork, uh, because the pigs all died when this particular merchant was transporting the sausage meat. Um, and... And um, and Daenerys is disappointed uh, by the by the horse sausages, uh, but her her Dothraki guards uh, enjoy it very much. Um, and Daenerys laughs at the belching antics of her Dothraki eating the sausages. Um, and and Eri is like, "Oh, it's good to see you laughing again, Danny. I haven't seen you laughing and happy like this since your brother was murdered." Um, which is like, wow, way to, <laughs> way to be a downer, Eerie, just when we're starting ha- to have a good time, just bring up Daenerys' dead brother. Um, that's, that's, that's not very cool, but whatever, Danny seems to roll with it, and Danny's like, yeah, it is good to laugh, even though my brother was just murdered with molten gold before my eyes. Yeah, I do feel innocent and happy again. Uh, so one of the themes of this chapter is it's about sort of innocence versus, um, danger and real politic and stuff. Um... Because as we soon learn, uh, this is not a place to be innocent um, and a child anymore. This is uh, we're getting we're getting into real politic territory pretty soon. Um, so we have a description of some of the goods that Danny peruses in the market, um, and she buys some things by trading a silver medallion on her belt uh, in order to get the goods, which is kind of pretty, I mean, it's pretty close to just using money when you're handing out silver medallions. I mean, they're essentially coins, right? Um, 
But but she's giving out these medallions in order to buy some goods from some of the vendors, um, and she gets a she gets a feathered cloak from the Summer Isles. Apparently, the one thing that the Summer Isles sell uh, is feathered cloaks. Apparently, that's their only export. One hundred percent of the GDP of um, of of the Summer Isles is feathered cloaks. Um, they must have a lot of birds and not much else because they are very into their feathered cloaks. Um, and, uh, someone tries to give her a bird, um, and blah, blah, blah. Doria, one of the handmaidens, wants a fertility charm, and so Danny gives it to her. Uh, and I'm sure you can base some kind of tinfoil theory off that fertility charm. Clearly, Doria is trying to get pregnant by Jorah when they're off on their bear business, uh, and the secret son of Jorah Mormont is probably out there somewhere. The son of Doria and Jorah, half bear, half... Uh, Essos, um, wandering Essos. That sounds like a hero in the making. Um, like a really shitty, <laughs> like a really shitty hero. It's, it's like Bear Man, but only like half Bear Man. I have half the powers of a bear. I, <laughs> one of my arms is a bear arm, and one of my legs is a bear leg. Uh, but it's like asymmetrical, like my left arm and my right leg is that of a bear, but the other half is just human, so I'm just totally disproportioned. I'm just this shambling, hairy thing, just roaming Essos, just eating, eating wayward travelers. That's, that's a sh- it, man bear pig. It's a bit like man bear pig, yeah. Jorah is essentially man bear pig. Um, sounds like a good D&D monster. Um, so anyway, so Danny's having a nice time in the market when she comes across a wine merchant. So this is the moment that uh, appears on the video, the still uh, that you can see, that picture of the Game of Thrones show in the video. We have Daenerys and her handmaidens and her Dothraki guards approaching this wine cellar. Um, this this whole sort of scene was followed quite closely um, by, uh, by the show. Um, and so the wine cellar's going, Oh, look at me, I got some sweet-ass reds, I got some tasty browns, I got some Andalish sours, I got them all, man, all the different flavors of vinegar, all the different kinds of piss, we got a kaleidoscope of alcohol, you know, we got it all. Um, he's got all these different kinds of grog. Uh, you know, um, he's got, he's got some of that awful rum, he's got port, he's got, he's got some, uh, fruit that was just left fermenting, um, in, in the bottom of, of, of his boot for a week, and, and now it's technically alcohol, he's got every flavor, um, every flavor to get you shrunk, uh, and he's going, yo, um, come and buy some of my wine, um, oh, someone asks, Someone asks what Aya's favorite dessert is. The only reason I bring that up is that's such a specific question that I feel like there must be a clever answer to it. I have no idea what Aya's favorite dessert is, but if you know, do tell me. Um, and so this wine cellar is going, come and get my wine, it's so whiny. Um, and Danny's like, oh, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll come and have a chug of, 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 your, of your vinegar. Um, and, and the wine cellar is like, hold on a moment, um, fr- fray cake is her favorite dessert. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. I, his favorite dessert can be fray cake, fray pie. Um, okay. And so, and so Danny's like, yeah, I'm from, uh, Westeros, actually. Um, I'm kind of famous, actually. Uh, I'm actually Daenerys Targaryen. And then, uh, Doria comes along and rattles off all of her, um, titles. You'd think they could save a lot of time with, a business card? Like, all these bloody lords and kings in, in Westeros are walking around with these with these people whose, like, whole job it is, is just to, like, say all of this person's titles, like, rider of the great grass sea, and breaker of the chains, and wearer of the straw hats, and, and shitter of the diarrhea in the Daenerys uh, 10, A Dance with the Dragons chapter. Just all these bloody fucking titles. She just needs to invest in a business card. It would probably be a, a fairly large business card. Actually, well, yeah, that, that is a good point, Max B. Daenerys saying, I'm from Dragonstone, is kind of ridiculous seeing that she she has, uh, from Westeros, is kind of ridiculous seeing that her entire time spent in Westeros was like, yeah, like a day on Dragonstone when she was born, or less. We don't, we don't, we don't really know how much time it was exactly, but it wasn't very long. Um, 
So anyway, Daenerys is like, look, I'm I'm pretty important because I come from Westeros, um, and uh, and so I think you just need to respect my authority. And the wine merchant's like, oh, of course, you claim to be uh, an, an aristocrat from a completely foreign continent that has nothing to do with me. I will treat you with the highest of respect, he does. So he's immediately lick-spittling and ass-kissing and all sorts of um, all sorts of saliva is flowing in order to demonstrate his subservience to Daenerys. Um, and so, and so, uh, and, and, and so he's going like, oh, I'll give you the best wine I've got, the best wine. So he pulls out the wine, uh, and the wine is marked with a, with a cluster of grapes, which is the sigil of House Red Wine. So this is another pretty impressive, uh, international transit of goods here. Not only has some gold come all the way from Carterly Rock to Vestothrak for trade, but some wine has come all the way from the Arbor in the north, uh, in the southwestern corner of Westeros, has come all the way uh, over to the market of Vestothrak. Um, so, pretty impressive transporting of goods. The postal service is a bit shaky, uh, but international transport of goods pretty impressive. Um, and so the wine merchant's like, all right, come and drink some of my delicious wine. It's going to be amazing. Um, and Danny's like, yep, I'm down. Let's get shrunked, man. You and me, shots. Um, and so the wine seller is like, yep, I got some special, some special Weschel, Weschel, special Weschel wine. Um, and he whips it out. The wine is what he whips out. And then uh, Jorah, Intervenes. Jor has intervened from uh, checking his mailbox, uh, and uh, he has returned and he says, Stop. Don't. No. Don't take the wine. Uh, and Danny's like, what, 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 what are you talking about? I just... I, I, it's just some tasty wine. It's going to be cool. But, but Jor is like, yep. Open the wine, and you have a taste. Taste your wine. And the guy's like, oh, oh dear me, no. Like, I don't... And, and Jor's looking quite threatening here. Like, Jor is unarmed. Because, of course, uh, in Vez Dothraki, you're not allowed to carry blades. Uh, so Jorah's unarmed, but, but Danny notes that his fists, his hands, are enough. So Jorah is quite imposing um, and looks quite strong, even when he's unarmed and he's just got his fist. Um, why is everyone talking about favorite foods in the comments? I don't know. Um, and so, and, and the wine cellar, meanwhile, has a hammer that he uses to open the casks with, like, the you know, the hammer to open the cask, uh, and he does not put his hammer down. So, again, like, even though you're not technically meant to have weapons, he has his little hammer that he uses for wine stuff. And, of course, there are also the eunuchs lurking around who have, like, the silk that they strangle people with. And uh, and what's his name? Jago, one of the Dothraki, he has a whip. Um, and so, you know, even though there's this prohibition against weapons in Phase Dothraki, or at least against blades, uh, everyone seems to have their own little workaround. Everyone has a way uh, of, of arming themselves, even when you're technically not meant to. Rules uh, are just reasons for people to get creative, uh, are all rules are. Um, and so Jorah's like, taste the wine. Uh, and so the bloke's like, oh, uh, look, I, you know, I, don't waste the wine on me. It's special wine, only for, only for Daenerys. Um, and, and, and Daenerys notes the sheen of sweat on his brow. You know that bit in, like, uh, what is it, like, L.A. Noir or whatever that game is where you have to, like, detect lies? Like, there are, like, these NPC video game characters who, like, have a, who, like, make a claim, and then you're meant to observe their face, and based on how their face re- responds, you're meant to judge whether or not they're lying. That's what this situation is, with the wine seller saying, this wine is totally not poison, zero percent poison content in this particular vintage, um, and then he like screws up his face with all his eyebrows pointing in different directions because that's how that's about how trustworthy this bloke looks at this particular time. Um, yeah, L.A. Noir is the game apparently, um, and so this guy's obviously lying. He's sweating fucking bullets. Like this guy's trying to poison Daenerys, um, and and Jorah's like, "Well, you're gonna drink the wine, or I'm gonna make you drink it." And so the guy's like, all right, let me do some calculations in my head. My options are drink the poisoned wine and die, uh, or run away. And so the wine seller wisely chooses option B. He throws the cask at Daenerys and runs. Uh, and Jorah's response <laughs> is, is kind of funny. When, when the wine seller throws a cask of wine at Daenerys, Jorah's response is not to, I don't know, catch <laughs> catch the, the, the cask. Uh, instead, he pushes Daenerys out of the way, which is like, uh, okay, all right, that's, that's, that's one way of doing it, but remember, Daenerys is a 
pregnant woman. So after after Jorah knocks the hell into Daenerys and knocks her over, she's falling and she almost lands on her belly, on her pregnant belly. She almost squat that. You don't want that. Um, but her handmaidens manage to catch her. But isn't that a dumb move by Jorah, pushing Daenerys instead of just catching the cask or, or just getting in the way or, or something? But whatever. Um, Jorah's, Jorah's not so good on the logistics. He's mostly good on the bear business in the woods. Um, and so, uh, and so the traitor runs away. Uh, but then, uh, Quaro, uh, oh yeah, 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 so one of the Dothraki Quaro reaches for his Iraq to kill the wine cellar, but of course he doesn't have any, his Iraq, so he just grabs air when he tries to reach for his Iraq. But meanwhile, the bloke with the, with the whip, um, Jogo manages to catch the wine cellar. Uh, and so the merchant captain, whose name is Bayan Vatiris, uh, says, Oh, that wine cellar guy, he was in my crew. I'm really sorry that he did that. I had nothing to do with the assassination. Um, in order to make it up for you, I'm going to give you all of his wine. Which is kind of kind of interesting on a bunch of levels. Like, first of all, how does Daenerys know that this Bayan Vatiris merchant captain wasn't in on the assassination plot that the wine cellar was planning? And number two, would you really take a whole bunch of wine from a bloke who just tried to poison you with wine. I mean, I understand that, you know, reasonably speaking, he probably wouldn't have poisoned all of his wine store. Um, but but still, like, would you want to drink wine that came from someone who was trying to poison you? What if there was poison in other casks, you know? What if his taste in wine is just shit? Um, he might not even be a real wine merchant. Maybe maybe this whole thing was fake in order to poison Danny. We don't know. Um, why is everyone asking about who's various characters' favorite foods are. I don't know what's going on in the comments. Um, but anyway, so that happens, and so the merchant captain apologizes, uh, and Daenerys is like, uh, fucking whatever. But then they get out of public, and then they have a conversation. Um, and Daenerys suddenly feels fear. Daenerys is feeling really freaked out by someone trying to murder her. Um, and so, and so fear is a taste that she has known before. She used to always be in terror of Viserys, and she thought that that was lifted now that Viserys was gone, but now she is even more terrified because she's got to look after herself, uh, and she's also got to look after, um, her, her unborn child, her baby. Um, so Daenerys, just a moment ago, was feeling very innocent and happy and thinking of herself that she was a girl again, but now she's feeling really afraid and freaked out. Um, and she, and she tries to comfort her unborn child who's wriggling in the womb, uh, and, and tells her unborn child that you are the blood of the dragon, little one. Which is a hell of a thing to lay on an infant, right? Like, I know a lot of parents have high expectations for their children, <clears throat> but telling them that they're the, the sole inheritor of, of the, of the Targaryen dynasty of dragon riding overlords is a pretty heavy thing to lay on a child. Like, that's even more than, you know, expecting them to be a doctor when they grow up. Uh, that's, that's, that's considerable pressure, pressure to lay on a child, especially when they haven't yet made it out of the womb. I mean, at least, at least wait until the child's birthday. Uh, their zeroth birthday before you start fucking telling them they've got to be king of a foreign continent one day. That's a bit much. Yeah, ex- yeah exactly. As um, a, fo- a, f- a blue fox in a box suggests, the baby was only deformed due to intense social pressure. It's only because Daenerys was so harsh on the baby saying, you must be the king of the fucking world, mate. You must fulfill the prophecy. You must do the thing. It's only because of those high expectations that the baby came out full of grave worms and with wings. Like, that was just like, like the baby was described as coming out with like or, like lizardy features and dragony features. Maybe that was just like the equivalent of like a child's like emo phase, uh, the child's like goth phase, in order to tell their parents that I don't play by your rules and I don't want to be a doctor like you told me. You know, maybe. All right, we're talking about a stillborn child. That's that's not. Let's move on. Um. So the usurper owes Drogo a lordship. Daenerys says. And the reason why she says that is because Jorah says that Robert Baratheon has offered lords uh, a lordship and lands to anyone who kills Daenerys. Um, and so the hilarious... Uh, or, or who kills Viserys. And so the hilarious irony uh, is that since Drogo killed Viserys, technically Robert Baratheon, by his own promise, uh, now owes uh, Drogo a lordship. Wouldn't it be great if Drogo just rocked up with his callousar, just turned up at Westeros, sailed into King's Landing and said, yo... Robert Baratheon, um, 
Can I be like uh, the Lord of Rosby now, please? Can you just give me like a village? Uh, because um, because I killed Viserys Targaryen and you promised lands and lordship to whoever did that. That would be pretty hilarious if that happened. Lord Drogo of House Dothraki, of House Horse Rider, of House Oiled Mustachios, of House Extremely Long Ponytail. Drogo's house words would be, ours is the ponytail. Um, that would be great. Um, and so, and so Daenerys is freaked out by the assassination attempt, as you would be, um, and, and, and she also feels a certain amount of anger. She thinks that the usurper, Robert Baratheon, has woken the dragon now. So Daenerys is starting to feel anger and violence against the person who tried to kill her, which again is an interesting reflection of Viserys. Even though Daenerys divorced herself from Viserys' influence in many ways, she internalized many of his values, including the idea of this sort of dragon wrath, you know. Um, so... So Daenerys has in some ways taken some of the worst qualities of Viserys, though not all of them. Um, and, and then she decides to put her dragon eggs in a fire. Because uh, her dragon eggs, of course, are not hatched. She believes them to just be fossilized rocks. She doesn't realize that it's possible to hatch them. Uh, but she has this intuition. She has this hunch that she needs to put the, the dragon eggs in a fire, and so she does. Um, and nothing happens. Um, but of course, later on, when she takes uh, uh, dragon eggs into the funeral pyre of Drogo, uh, the eggs do hatch. Uh, so it's not a bad intuition. But it's a weird decision, given that, she, given that she has no real evidence at this point that anything good will happen from doing that. Uh, and so Daenerys herself acknowledges this, thinking, is it madness that made her put the eggs in the fire? Madness born of fear? Uh, which is perhaps a little, a little uh, hint, warning sign about the whole concept of like Targaryen drag, uh, Targaryen madness. There's this quote about how you know every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin, uh, whether the Targaryen will be mad or sane. Um, and this talk of Daenerys questioning her own sanity uh, is not a very good sign in that direction. Um, and so she does it, she puts the dragon eggs into fire. Uh, and the dragon, the dragons do not hatch from the eggs at this time. Um, but, but Daenerys thinks, wow, okay, well maybe, you know, maybe if my dragon eggs won't hatch, maybe that's it for the dragons. Maybe the Targaryens and their legacy is kind of over. Maybe Rhaegar Targaryen, my brother, was the last dragon, and I, I can't carry on the Targaryen legacy. Maybe all I can be is just a Dothraki, and maybe these eggs um, are only pretty rocks. And then Drogo arrives. Ding dong, honey, I'm home. What happened while I was gone? An assassination attempt. Uh, I'm going to have some words about that. So Drogo turns up and he learns about the assassination. And then Drogo... Uh, Drogo's not a man to take the attempted assassination of his wife uh, sitting down. He stands up and he says, um, All right. Here's what's happening. Here's my response to this attack on my wife, my Khaleesi. Uh, I'm going to give any horse... Uh, that you want to Jorah uh, for saving Daenerys from the wine, um, which is like, great, reward the person who saved your woman from assassination. But on the other hand, Jorah was, was, was an instrumental part in arranging that assassination because, of course, uh, Jorah told Varys that Daenerys was pregnant, which is why Robert Baratheon ordered the assassination of Daenerys. Uh, so Jorah kind of caused the assassination that he averted. So it is ironic that Drogo rewards him for it. Um, and then Drogo says, all right, all right, so someone from Westeros, the king of Westeros, tried to kill my woman, so in, in retaliation, I declare that I will conquer Westeros, I will sail my Kalasar west in the wooden horses, I will do what no Dothraki has done before, I will kill all of the knights, I will tear down all the castles, I will rape their women, I will take their children as slaves, and I will break their gods and drag them back to Vase Dothrak. This I vow to do, Drogo, I swear it, towards the mother of the mountains. And then they march off with the wine cellar tied to the back of Danny's horse. Um, so on the one hand you can sort of go, oh wow, yay, we're gonna you know, uh, we're gonna make, we're, we're gonna realize Danny's destiny to take over Westeros as a Targaryen. Um, and on the other hand, you're like, 
wow, this warlord is promising to kill, rape, and enslave innocent people in a foreign continent, which is about as as close to a definition of evil that you can actually possibly think of. Um, I mean, honestly, this is like almost like Euron-level shit. Like, you know, breaking their gods and dragging them back to Vaisdoth Rack and, and, and all that stuff. Like, that's that's seriously nasty stuff. But because we see this through the eyes of Daenerys, who is in love with Drogo, um, well, debatable, but who, 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 who is at least allied, connected to Drogo, um, and she believes she's entitled to conquer Westeros because of the whole Targaryen thing, uh, what we as readers are sort of pushed to see it as a good thing for Drogo to go and take over. Um, but I think it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, math uh, in order to figure out that, you know, maybe this foreign conquest with, well, with all the rape and the enslavement is uh, maybe not great, you know? Just a thought. Hey, Daenerys, if you really care about, like, you know, saving slaves and stuff, maybe you should, uh, you know, not kill random people all the time. Just a suggestion. Um, so that concludes this chapter, I think. Um, it's it's an interesting chapter. I think this is sort of like the the first ch- the first real challenge that Daenerys faced. Like 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 we've we've passed through the veil. Daenerys has entered the new uh the new uh, world of of the Dothraki, and so she she's left her state of comfort at the beginning of the hero's arc, and she's passed through the veil to a new challenging world. But now she's actually faced the first real challenge. Someone's tried to kill her, um, and w- and we also now have this momentum, this movement towards conquering Westeros. So. Things are really starting to move now, and, and we have opposition, and we have direction, and, and the plot is actually starting to move. And it's very similar to what happened uh, with the Whites in with the Whites in, jo- in John's chapter. So, so John, the the icy opposite to Daenerys's fire, is pretty similar. So he's sort of like settled into his new life at the Night's Watch. He's left his comfortable life at Winterfell. And what he faced last chapter was a zombie for the first time uh, that tried to kill him, just as the wine cellar tried to kill Daenerys. So for the first time, both our icy hero and our fiery hero have overcome direct violent threats to their person um, and now have a, 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 be- a beginning to feel a sense of here's the direction that we need to take this fight. This is where I need to direct my resources from now on. Daenerys is like, okay, we're seriously starting to move in the direction of conquering Westeros. And Jon is starting to think, wow, this, this zombie apocalypse might actually be a serious thing, uh, and it might take more than fiddling with your Streamlab uh, settings to turn off the zombie apocalypse onto your stream. Um, so I think that's a good place to conclude this chapter. Um, cool. I think that was an interesting chapter. Uh, it was quite quite loyally represented one in the show. Um, and it's cool to see the extra sort of flavor that's in the books about, uh, all the stuff in the markets and all of the colorful stuff going on. So, um, I think that's a good chapter. Thank you for coming to the live stream, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for rolling with the unusual, uh, time. I know this is off schedule, um, yeah, normally there is normally there is a set schedule. Normally do, we do 9 p.m. Eastern time on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, um, and we will continue to do that. I'm I'm not actually 100 percent sure if we're going to do the next regularly scheduled one uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time, given that we've done this one. I don't know if we'll treat this as an early one or an extra one. Is this episode early or extra? I'm not sure. Uh, we'll we'll see. Um, but thank you all for attending. I'm really glad these extra little features on the live stream are working. That's exciting. Um, and yeah, we can do a super quick Q and A. Um, we'll, we'll get a couple of Qs for a couple of A's. Um, <laughs> the song guessing stuff. We we could have it as a regular feature, couldn't we? Like where I just duply dupe my way through um through some songs that I can't remember the name of, and you guys hunt it down. We could have like a prize as well, couldn't we? That would be pretty fun. We could start giving out prizes to people who guess the correct song. Uh, th- there are there are podcasts where they do things like that, I think. Um, uh, but I don't know. Have we got any questions? Questions, questions? Not, not a single tangent, says Satanos complains. I think there might have been at least one, at least one tangent. Uh, no, I'm not going to say spank me daddy again. Uh, oh, shit, just did it. Um... 
East Coast or West Coast. Uh, uh, I'm more of a fan of Biggie than Park, to be honest. Uh, one more question. Um, any more questions? Hogwarts House. Um, uh, please not Slytherin. Please not Slytherin. Please not Slytherin. That's my answer. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, have lovely days. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, who donated. Um, thank you, everyone, who, who has purchased on Bandcamp as well. We will look into other platforms other than Bandcamp. Uh, but thank you to those people who have uh, done stuff there. Uh, and, yes, we will have a comment on the YouTube video about where the Discord group is and where the Facebook group is. Um, and I think that sorts it all out. So long and good night.